So before I even get into the message today, uh, just a bit of background. We are, we are entering a series um, based on our values, who we are as a church. And the reason for that is a lot of things have started happening in the recent months and we named our year in the beginning of the year and we trust in God to do amazing things and different people have different words over their year. But one of the things we're trusting for was to move into this room next door as we step into a, a, a bigger area, a bigger space, enlargement. And so that's happening and it actually almost crept up on us a little bit as a church. And um, before you know it, it's going to be Father's Day and uh, we will be in that room on Father's Day. It's all great up here. Don't worry. And so what we're doing is to, to prepare us for that, we actually have to be ready, all of us individually, because for church to work, we have to work. For, for the different departments to work, it doesn't just happen that you, you know, your kids are taken care of. How awesome was worship the morning, this morning? There was no reason for you to stop. You know, it's, They're not a distraction. They part on the journey, but there's no reason for you to stop because why? We have got people that are sowing into their lives and actually going to teach them how to worship and praise and, and push into God and understand the things of God. And so for that to work, they need to work. And for this to work, we need to work. And for us to move into that new room, a whole lot of things have to happen. And so because we're on this new journey and God's doing it, going to do so much more and he's doing it quite quickly, we all have to be on the same page so that we understand why we're doing certain things in, um, and, and, and what's important to us. And so when we move in there, there's a whole, there's a foundation that's already been established so everyone can get planted into those things. And so as we start, I just want you to watch a quick video clip and then I'm going to carry on. You good? Sit back, relax, and enjoy. You ready, Dan? We're
How good was that? How good is that? You can stop it. So did you hear what he said? Many times we go, what are we doing? What are we doing? Why are we, what are we doing? What, just tell me what to do. But without knowing why you're doing that, sometimes your what's can just be a whole bunch of things that are happening. In order for us to know what we're doing, we need to know why it's going to happen. And this is what he said. He said, when you know your why, we have options to what our what can be. And so when you know your what, your why, your what has more impact because you're walking towards your purpose or your destiny. So what could be anything? It could be greeting somebody. It could be, let's talk about church setup just for five seconds and we'll make it a bit. It could be serving in kids' church. It could be praying behind the scenes. It could be pitching up and carrying heavy banners. It could be just being here to be available to speak to somebody. But why you do those things? Why, like making dinner for your family, looking after people, speaking life, all these things that we are going to go on a journey. We're going to do a lot of what's in the next few weeks, maybe five, six weeks. We're going to carry on with a few what's, but the why's have to be quite strong. So today, we're starting off with the what, the first what. What are we strong? What do we believe in? What is one of the core values of the church? And it's built on the Word of God. It has to start there. As a church, we are a Bible-based church where everything we do has to line up with the Word of God. That is what we believe. And so for us to go anywhere further from that, we have to know what the Word says. And so today, we're going to give a few what's as headings, and then hopefully I'll do a good enough job to try and explain to you the why those things are important to us as a church. And so I've got quite a few scriptures today. Don't get distracted by trying to write them all down. They're going to be up on on the overhead projector, if you could just take the references. Because the why, the Bible is full of whys. Full of whys. And so today, as we start, I just want to say from right in the beginning is that when we allow our why to have an outworking, then, you know, when we know our what and we know our why, like nothing really matters until you know the who. Because the who, who is Jesus, actually gave you the why and the what's in the first place. And so as a church, it all goes back in, in, in this massive sort of, it starts here, it ends here, it all revolves around him. It's all about the word of God, who, who God is. And so um, we're just going to start right away. If you guys want to get your, your notepads out, if you want to just get straight onto the page with me, please please do. And please just stay with us, right? Father, I just thank you that today as we speak your word, Father God, your word is truth. Your word is powerful. Your word creates and brings life, God. Your word divides. Your, your word instructs. And so, Father God, today, even as we just look at your word, Father, I pray that we would not grow blind or, or, or deaf to the truth, but, Father God, our hearts would come alive as we speak your word, God, over our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, first of all, the why, the word is, one of our main core values is because in in 2 Timothy 3:16 it says all scripture is God breathed and it is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness. Everything between the the pages of your Bible is directly breathed from God. It is God breathed. Not one word is in that Bible that God didn't already ordain and preordain to be in there. Not one word has been left out of that Bible that he didn't want in there. So we have to know that everything we read is because God put it in there. And the other thing that when you think about the Bible and you think about all these things, is one book, one book that has been passed down from generation to generation to generation that has been translated into more languages that we even know exist. And yet it's still the most popular book ever. And it's not a book that you can pick up and you can read and go, well, I've done that. Because who is God who is so created that will give you one book to think that you've done it, you've achieved it when you've read it once? It's when you look into it, there are layers upon layers upon layers of truth in there. It is so full of life that it is going to carry on for generations to come until we meet him. And never, ever can you exhaust God. And never, ever can you read that Bible and go, well, I've read that scripture before. But in every scripture, God has got so much more to show us. And so maybe you're sitting here today going, well, I don't even know all the books in the Bible. Great. Then you're just starting. That's a good place to be. But a dangerous place to be is, I've read it. I know it. I can quote it to you and I can even give you the scriptures. 
references. But what God is saying is, okay, okay, but are you getting the life out of it? That one scripture that you've read so many times, is it still causing an awakening in your heart? Is it still causing you to burst forth with joy and, you know, do whatever you feel like doing? But like it creates a life within you. Is it still doing that to you? That one book, it's not stale. And so when you, when you read, when you read the Bible, you've got to read it and approach it knowing that God, this is you speaking to me. It's not just a letter that I love reading that is so nice that you read to me, but God, you want to say something to me in this moment because it is God breathed. In Proverbs 30, it says, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. It is pure. There is nothing in the word of God that is going to be off, broken, off putting. Maybe sometimes off putting if we don't want to line up with it. You know, it's going to be hard to read certain things, but it is pure. In 1 Thessalonians 2, it says, we continually, we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. Wouldn't it be awful if every Sunday you came to church and I did a little skit for you? I could have prepared a song, which would be terrible. I could prepare a little dialogue, monologue, a little poem I wrote. And that's all I did every single Sunday. Or any person that stands up here and goes, let me just tell you what I feel like I want to tell you. Oh, I read the story. You would leave unchanged. You would have a good time if we were funny, you know. Sometimes we're funny. Or, you know, you would have good coffee. But what in your heart would change? So unless we are actually speaking the word, which you realize when people step up here, it cannot be a, Oh, I've got a good idea. Good ideas are not God. It has to be God to say things. I mean, some good ideas are from God. Don't twist what I'm saying. But it has to be a God-based thing that people bring you. It has to be lining up with the Word. Just because somebody sticks a Christian sticker on it, I'm a Christian comedian, I'm a Christian this, I'm a Christian that, if it doesn't line up with the Word of God, it doesn't carry any weight. And this says we have to be able to approach the Word of God and receive the Word of God knowing that it's directly from God, not human opinion. The sec the, another point is, is that God's Word is eternally true and it will never, ever fail. It will never fail. In 1 Kings 8, 56, this is a mixture of Old Testament, New Testament, how they, the one complements the other, the one finishes what the other one says. The whole Bible, when you start studying how it's true and relevant and who put it together, there are so many scientific facts and things that I can't even pronounce. But I will send you the people who can and you can listen to it. It is true. So here in 1 Kings 8, it says, Praise be to the Lord who has given us Rest to his people, Israel, just as he has promised. Not one word has failed of all the good promises he gave us through his servant Mo Moses. Not one word has failed. And when you go back and you study the scriptures and you see how it starts in Genesis and how it, it has a, a, a thread going past, people prophesied about what would happen and Jesus do this. And the fact that Jesus fulfilled every single prophecy that was spoken over him, from generations that never met him, people who wrote these scriptures that never met each other. When you look at the probability of those things happening, we can't even understand it. People that try and explain it start talking about the state of Texas and, you know, all these things. And, uh, you know, I'll send you the links. You can go and study it. But the thing is, he is not one word has failed. The words God has spoken over you, not one word has failed. The gospel that he's penned down over and over again in the scriptures, that is the line that literally just carries through the whole Bible, it's not going to fail you. And it's from generations past to this generation to generations to come. It will never fail. Psalm 119 says, Your word, Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. It says heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will never fail. All your words are true. All your righteous laws are eternal. Isaiah says, The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of God endures forever. There is no limit to the word because he is the word. Jesus is the word who, who came in and, and, and made flesh and dwelt among us. That, the, the message translation says he, he came in and he, he moved into the neighborhood. He just made himself at home. The word of God made flesh. 
it's never going to disappear or diminish or get, you know, rust or whatever you want to, want to even think. It's never going to. The next scripture is Isaiah 55, and it says, As the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish. That's what the Word of God does. So when I'm teaching you these things today, it's not, it is a bit of teaching and it's a lot of scripture because the scripture is going to bring life. I can explain it in all my words, but God himself has said it. And the root, and not the root, the result of actually having this word that comes down to us is that there's things in our lives that have to bud and have to flourish. Because that's what it's saying. As the snow comes down and, and, and do not return watering the earth and make it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, there has to be a fruit that's produced in our lives when we're spending time reading the Word of God. Now, you might not even know it. You might just think, oh, this is hard. Oh, I don't even know where to start. Oh, I don't even know the books of the Bible. Oh, I don't even know that was in the Bible. It doesn't matter because the power of God in those words, as we read them, goes into our hearts, goes into our lives, and there has to be a budding, a flourishing, something that seed form will start taking root in your life. And you might, you know, there are so many people that disqualify themselves because you don't think you know enough. And on the other hand, you've disqualified yourself because you think you know it all. And the reality of it is there is seed form in our lives. We haven't even touched the surface of what God's going to do through our lives. We're moving into that hall and that looks amazing and it's going to be fun and we don't know who God's going to bring our way. But that's just a tiny thing. I mean, we could imagine it. Can you imagine moving in there? God says that he's got things stored up for us that we can't actually imagine. You can't even dream up. You can't even think up. How small is that? compared to what he's still got inside for us. So when you read his word, the, the, the word waters and, and, and makes things bud and flourish and gives us something to work with. Why? Seed for the sower so that we've got something to actually contribute. Because when you speak the word of God over somebody else's life, you are sowing seeds. You've got something that is tangible, something that is life-giving, and you can actually come in line with the word of God and say, well, God's word says. You pray with somebody and go, well, God's word says. You've got something to sow. And somebody can re receive it. So is my word, he says, that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for what it is sent. There is a purpose in the words on these pages for your life and mine, for our future, for our generations to come. Those kids, they're not sitting there watching a DVD. And if they were, it would be a very well-planned, thought-out DVD. But everything is word. Busy, it's, and you, there's a whole new thing. The seeds, sprouts, roots. It's this whole thing about growing. The word of God is being planted. Matthew 24 says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. First Peter 1.25 says, But the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. When you listen and you, and you dive in and you say, God, what is these things? What are these things that are going to keep me? Keep me from moving away from you. Keep me from slipping. And there are so many scriptures, and I'm actually going to send you these notes because it's actually scriptures that we need to know and, and build our lives on. So all of these things are in bullet form, easy for you to read. You can have it. You can start your old folders. I'm going to email them out to you just so that you know that so you can make this a truth in your own life. The importance of this, listen to this scripture in Deuteronomy. He says, take, it, take to heart all the words of warning I've given you today. Pass them on as a command to your children so they will obey every word of these instructions. But look at this. These instructions are not empty words. They are your life. If we understood that we actually cannot function and grow and do this life and, and live up to these things because it's just some good words on a page and sometimes you feel good and, and actually, you know, you might be having a sad day and God goes, oh, I love you. You're so beautiful. And you walk out, oh, that's nice. Do we realize that these words are not just empty words? Flattery, they're not flattery. Flattery gets us nowhere in life. But speaking truth in love, speaking life, those are the things that are actually going to build, equip, and move people forward into their destiny. And it says, these instructions are your life. They are your life. Think about that for a second. What if, what if your lifeline was cut and we didn't even know it? You didn't even know it because it's all in this word. And it says they're not just instructions. It is your life. 
I pray today that as we read these scriptures, and even myself, that something in us starts going, I need more of that, God. I actually, I need to understand it, and, and maybe you don't even understand it. I have a, a, the privilege of, of sitting under somebody, um, a lady named Lauren Vermark, and she's one of our teachers in, in South Africa, and she's an intercessor, and she, she, she knows the Word of God, and she can quote the scriptures and, and all the rest, and she's not loud, and she's not outgoing, and she could walk into a room, and, and you might not even really realize that she's there unless you speak to her. She's that sort of person. But the power of knowing what God's Word is, is in her. You can sit in a conversation, and she speaks like this. Like sometimes you lean in. You know, like when you say have a posture of leaning in? When you're in her room, you sort of have to have a posture of leaning in because she just quietly speaks the Word of God. And as I was studying these scriptures and as I was going through all my notes and, and the years of actually being around in Bible college and sitting under her ministry, and, and you know, sometimes you think it's the whole dancing around on the, on the stage and, and, and being able to, to communicate great and have all these jokes and all these things. And that, those are the people we want to be. But then you sit in a room, or some of us, you know, you think that's the way it's forward, and you know. But some of us, you sit in this room and you go, she just reads the scriptures. She's just teaching me the Bible. And I remember sitting in her room once, it's a tiny room in her office, and we were just talking about the things of God. We were just talking. And all she said was, look at this scripture. Oh, look at this scripture. Oh, and the next thing is this. Now you read that scripture. Now you turn to the next one and you read that one. She didn't even give her own opinion or correspondence or write up what she thought God was saying in it. All she did was read the scripture and I felt in my heart this excitement building up and it was almost like there was just an unlocking of stuff that you think, how's that going to work? I'm waiting for her to teach me and all she's doing is reading the Bible to me because the Bible itself has enough power to do that to you. I can't. If you've come here to say, oh, Charlene, what are you going to tell me today? You're going to leave with something you might forget or you might be, you know, nothing. Nothing really. Empty words. Let's just be real. It has to be the Word of God that starts unlocking things in your life. So it says, this is your life. By obeying them, you will enjoy long life in the land and you will occupy when you cross the Jordan River. The Word is Jesus. It is Jesus made flesh. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So when we're sitting and we're taking this Word and we're reading it and we're making it our own, you are sitting with Jesus. You are sitting, reading Him, learning Him, understanding Him, finding out how He responded and how He functioned and how He, he carried these things. It's not just to sit there and do a religious duty. Because heaven forbid the enemy tells you, like, you've got to read your Bible. And if you haven't read your Bible, you're not a good Christian. That is not the purpose of reading your Bible. And if that's the only reason you're Bible, you are not going to get out of it what you need to. You actually need to go, God, this is your word. This is who you are. This is everything you've given. It is life unto me. It says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Like I said earlier in the message, he moved into the neighborhood. He made his home where you are. We have seen his glory and the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. There is power in the Word. The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I've spoken to you, they are full of life and spirit. When you speak the Word of God, life has to come forth. If you didn't know that, go, God, I need life in my life. I need life in my finances, life in my parenting, life in my wisdom, life in my business decisions, life in my relationships, life in my personal thoughts. I need some life because there's some things that are just lying a bit squashed, dormant, trodden on, kicked out the door, and I just need a bit of life. Or actually, I don't know how to do this next season. Charlene, you are telling me that things are going to happen. I'm going to step into this wide open space, but I don't want to step into this wide open space because I don't want anyone looking at me. I don't want anyone asking me questions. And don't make me speak to somebody. It's going to be in this place where God goes, the power is when you actually partake of this and I give you seed to sow. Where it's not about you, actually. It's about what God has done in you. And it's life. Everything we sow will produce life. That's one of our values that we will get to. We speak life in this church. You'll hear it again. And don't get sick of it because we need to be reminded. Psalm 33 says, The word of the Lord 
the heaven, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. Their starry hosts by the breath of his mouth. He created with his words. Everything we have today, everything that is seen and unseen. Got little kids running around, they're going, how will people know about God? What about nobody tells them? The Bible says, I've told them. If they just took a moment and gone, look at this tide. It comes in and it stops and it goes back. Look at the, the, the mountains, look at the birds, look at the, you know, nature itself shouts forth his praise. If it just took a step back and gone, everything is in perfect order, everything, because he keeps it by his word. We are created by his word. So when you're speaking the word of you, he is creating new things in you. He is creating life. He is creating greatness. He is creating vision. He is creating future. Because that's the word of God. It creates. Romans says, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation. By this we get new life, which is salvation life. That Jesus died. He died so that not one person would end up in the realm of death. He died so that you would be saved. If you don't know you needed a savior, you needed a savior. We have been born into a world that has fallen, that is full of sin, and that is owned by the enemy because of just legal rights being given over to him in Genesis. And so the destiny of every person that has been born into this is, is ultimately eternity away from God. And so if you don't know that, let me tell you today, if you don't have a rescuer going, I don't want you to go to that destiny, I've got a much greater destiny, just come with me. Our hearts should respond and say, I don't want to be going in a direction that I actually had no control over. And right now I want to make a decision to say, Jesus, I need you as my rescuer. It's the power of God that brings to salvation. In Hebrews it says, by faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. He spoke it. He just said, let it be, and it was good. Let it be, and it was good. So that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. He spoke the world into creation. More than that, it is our powerful spiritual weapon. It says in Ephesians, in, in the armor of God, and they're doing it in kids' church today, is take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. You can quote Scripture, and you can defeat and overcome the enemy going, no, 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 this is what the Word says, which goes straight into Matthew 14. Jesus is the Word of God. He is God, made flesh, moved into the neighborhood. And then when he was on earth, he was taken up to a mountaintop and said, I will give you this. The enemy, the devil, Satan, said, if you bow down to me, I will give you this. If you bow down to me and you do the things that I want you to do, I will, I will give you all the riches of this world. And the living word starts quoting the written word. Jesus himself starts going, it is written. There is power in knowing the Word of God. Jesus, the Word, became flesh, was with God, is God, that whole scripture, the Word is God, is Jesus. He sits in a conversation with the enemy, and the enemy's going, what about this, what about this, what about this? And he's actually attacking the actual Word, and he just re re responds with the written Word of God. You might say that, devil, but it is written. How will you fight the fights that come up against you? People's opinions, people's offenses, people's insensitivities of just, you know, walking straight past you and almost knocking the wind out of you. If you don't go, actually, no, God, you said, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. What your experiences have been, we've got to know what is written for us to say, no devil. That does not line up with the word of God. In Hebrews 12, and he says it three times, he says to him, no, 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 no. For the word of God is alive and it is active. And when you think about that, you might think, oh, I had a session, I put time aside, and I walked away feeling like, Bleh. and I wanted to have a massive revelation, and I want to be able to tell you what God said to me. And sometimes you might feel like that. But just know that God actually really wants to speak to you. But the other thing is, when you think about something that's alive and it's active, and, and is active and it says it's sharper than a double-edged sword and it penetrates what what does it mean if you thought penetrates it actually goes in without your control without limitations 
And if you take ink and you drop a dot of ink on, on, on a serviette or, or something like that, it penetrates, you know, on a brand new duvet and your kids come and draw ink on your duvet, you know, it just runs and it spreads and there's nothing you can do about it and it stains. Even if your name is Johan Hreilung, it stains. <laughs> you can get stains out of everything. But this is the word of God. It says it, it comes in, it penetrates, it is active, it's alive, it moves, it goes into all the parts of your life and your heart. If you say, God, I want this, come and show me. It cuts, it divides, it's going, this is from God, this is not from God. If you would allow it, and, you and actually even if you don't allow it, it convicts, you can shut it down. But it convicts and it says it divides and it separates soul and spirit. What is just our will? what we think, what our interpretation is versus what is God's will, what he thinks and what he said. It comes, it divides, it corrects us in a gentle way where you're going, oh, I used to respond like this, or I used to think this. And he's going, actually, I don't know if that was the right response. Or I don't know if I'm reading the situation right. I, I, maybe I need to just, you know, start paying attention to how he's dividing. And it's just carrying on as you read the word of God over yourself. It was written for our benefit. Because it says everything that was written in Romans in the past is written to teach us. We are being taught. There are Bible students that they've devoted their entire life, generations, and all they do is study this word. And they've written books and teaching things on one particular scripture. And then they find themselves back in that particular scripture. And God shows them there's so much more to that. It is to teach us. I'm learning. You're learning. We're learning which is a great thing because we can't actually look at somebody and go, oh, you don't know this because you don't know everything either. So Thursday nights, we sit in a room and we go, hey, I've never thought of it that way. Oh, I went back and I studied something. Can I share that with you? Hey, have you thought of this? Have you thought of that? It is a good opportunity to just talk about the Word of God. That's what it's about. It's about sitting and going, what is it, God? What more can we learn? What more? Because we are being transformed into his likeness. How? By the renewing of the mind. How? By spending time with the creator that knows how we need to be, be functioning. It saves us. It says the law of God in Psalms 37 says, is in their hearts so their feet do not slip. It's so easy to get distracted, to slip, to make mistakes, to, you know, think of yourself more highly than you ought or, you know, and he goes, if your word, if the word dwells in you, your feet will not slip. If you keep your, my commandments and remain in love, just I've kept the Father's commands and remained in his love, it keeps you, it keeps you remaining in that place. The power of the word has to be the foundation to everything we do. Why are we here today? Why do you devote yourself to these things? Because it all comes out of understanding that you've been saved. You've been rescued from a life apart from God. From eternity, not a life. Life starts and ends. There's a start date and an end date for every single one of us. Even if Jesus comes back again, there's an end date. But eternity does not have an end date. And he's been, we've been saved from that. It gives us faith, truth, and wisdom. It says, consequently, consequently in, in Romans 10, it says, faith comes from hearing. Our faith to trust God for more is going to be because we realize that what he's spoken is true. And we don't know what he's spoken. We need to find out what he's spoken. If you're trusting God for breakthrough in an area, speaking life over your children, speaking life over yourself, you've got to know what the word said for you to be able to go, God, you said. You said. And, and let me just stop there for a second. One of the, the, the titles I could have, you know, put out there is, come to church and I will give you the keys to success and prosperity in your life. Everybody wants the keys to success and prosperity in their life. Because when you think about that, you're going to think big houses. No, you won't. Some people think big houses, big cars, no debt, da, 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 yachts, holidays, first class tickets. Everybody wants success and prosperity. But the Word of God says, keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. It wouldn't have been even a fake title because the Bible says if you do these things in Joshua 1.8, it says if you keep this, if you meditate, if you know me, you will live a prosperous and a successful life. Who doesn't want that? 
But it doesn't come out of our own getting up early, slaving away, don't spend time with our family, keep going on, saying yes to every other person's like expectations and lists of things to do. It starts with the God, you, you, you said. And you can study characters in the Bible. You can study the life of Daniel. He was promoted because he understood God. And he had massive favor. And he was thrown into the lion's den. But yet something God kept him because he understood. And he did not depart from the word of God. You got Joshua, uh, Joseph. Joseph who also, he was, you know, his brothers were out to take him down. And they even tried to kill him and threw him in the pit. And, and then he was saved for something greater. And he kept his heart pure. And he kept on meditating on the word of God. And he didn't, didn't move away. And then... Prosperity and success followed. He was given, he was given charge over the whole land. He had wisdom to know that there was going to be seven years of famine and seven years of, 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 of surplus and other way around. And, and, and then he knew, and people were coming to him going, you, you've already known this, but for years to come before that, God show him. Years. And so he just carried what God had prepared in his heart. And so God could put him in a place of success and prosperity where people came to him going, what is it that we can do? And he had something to give them because he had spent time investing. And you can study that and how people did that and how people stepped into more. Abraham, Abraham was given a promise. And although it sounds like he's taking away things when he gives him the promise in Genesis 12, he says, now leave your nation, your country, your father's, your, your, your relatives, your father's house. He just takes it away. And it just feels like this is tearing and it's getting smaller and it's smaller because what I've got for you is so much bigger than these things. And so Abraham is our father of faith. And after all these years, we are his children. We're living in his inheritance. And all it was is that he said, God, you said, if your word says go, I will go. If your word says do this, I will do this. And he entered into a life of prosperity and influence and success. It doesn't come the same way we think it will come. The word guides us and keeps us. In Psalm 19, it says, The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the, the eyes. Sometimes it's just so easy to slip into negativity. It is so easy before you even know it, your response is, Yes, but. Or not on this, not on this life. Or I've tried that. Or don't count me in. Or it doesn't happen to me, it happens to everybody else. And sometimes it's easy to just get stuck in this place where you, you can feel things aren't right, but you don't actually know how to get out of those places. The Bible says, Your precepts are right, giving joy to my heart. Joy to our heart is going to be the thing that overflows into our outlook in life. Joy to our heart is going to change just that slight negativity to, hmm, but God said, that slight sort of despondency, but wait, hang on, God's not over. He said, because he creates and it is good. And so if it's not good, we've got to understand going, God, what, you, we're still in the process. It's not over until we see why things happen. Now, don't, I'm not saying nothing bad's going to happen. I'm just saying the end result, he knows. He says he works everything for the good of those who love him. So unless you realize and you know what that good was, you're still in the process. And that's okay, because there is going to be the end of the process. Though I walk through the valley of death, walk through the valley of death, or shadow of death, shadow, thank you, not even, not even the shadow of death, you are walking through it. Maybe somebody just needs to be reminded of that today. You are on a journey, and you are not stuck there, and don't sit down there. Don't go, this is my lot in life, I don't know how to get out of here. Pick up the word and say, God, I don't even know where to read. But your word says that you will shine a light and you would restore joy and you would give light to my eyes so that I can see. It says your word is a lamp to my feet, a light into my path. I don't know how to turn out of this situation. I don't know how to stop the way I'm thinking. I don't know how to stop feeling these fears. I don't know how to even think about the future. And God is all about future and all about new beginnings. He goes, my word is a lamp unto your feet and a light into your path. He says the unfolding word. This is all Psalm 119, the longest book in the Bible. Take time and read it. Don't read it all in one day because it's a lot. Take time and break it down. Five, five verses. It's all about God, your word. Your word says that you will give, your words will give light and understanding to the simple. I wonder if it would be offensive if we called Psalm 119 the word of God for dummies. 
because it is so simple. You know those books? Those books are great. I've got a few. You know, Access for Dummies, PowerPoint for Dummies, Business Management for Dummies. It's not bad. It says it gives understanding to the simple. It is something that we actually have to understand because you pray over your kids, you pray over your life, you pray over your grandchildren, and it's like, God, I pray that they would just stay the path and they would stick to this journey and they would, would stay pure. I, play, I pray so much purity over my kids because of the world we live in and the lies and the schools and the, you know, people, some kids just are a little bit vile and they don't understand more and they don't understand anything else. And so I'm like, protect them, God. I pray that they wouldn't even hear certain things, you know. Make them just not hear it. And the Bible says, how? How are they going to stay pure? And the answer is right there, by living according to your word. So it's not about fighting everything and stopping them from seeing friends and stopping them from having conversations and nobody can come to their house. It's about actually giving them something to stand on. Giving them that word that divides and cuts and, and starts teaching them going, yeah, that, ki- that, that conversation wasn't that great. That movie is not that great. That music you're listening to is not that great. So they can start making those decisions for themselves. So that we can understand it. We can't just be putting out fires. We've got to understand the why. And so, in conclusion, if we had to be honest about the Bible and how simple it sounds when I tell you and hopefully you're sitting going, yeah, I can do that and I want that. Hopefully. Yeah. Anybody? Anyone who go and read your Bible, you can go now. But the other thing is, it's probably one of the biggest things we have to fight for because it's such a little thing. It's probably one of the biggest obstacles to get over in our life because it's such a small thing. And I tell you what, when you decide, I'm going to read my Bible, there's a nappy to change, somebody knocks on your door, people pop in for coffee and they never, they never come. Or you're so tired and you fall asleep. Who has not done prayer reading before? Will you close your eyes? The hard part is when you're reading on an iPad and you knock yourself out. That's, that's you know, it's never happened to me. It happens to me all the time. No, I'm joking. <laughs> but when you're dozing off, because why? Because if we understood the why the word is so important, we would understand why the enemy doesn't want you to read it. Why he just wants you to think, it's not, it's not for me, I can't do it. Why he thinks you don't have time. You don't have time, you're going to be late for this and you're going to do this and somebody else needs you and, you know, why you don't get anything out of it. Because if you understood all those things that it equips, it tells you who you are in Christ. You can actually realize, I'm not living the way God actually designed me to live. I'm not experiencing all these fruit that he's promised that I would experience. And you can say, "Uh, that's not right. And you can start fixing these things and the enemy will go, I don't want that for your life. I want you to stay in that distraction, in the slump, in the overwhelm, in the fear, in the lack, in the negativity. I want you to stand there. And so the attack on your why is huge. And so you might think it's just the Bible. I'll get it from listening to a podcast. It's not the same. This is your life. The words written in these pages are your life. It is not just encouragement and equipping and teaching. It is your life. And God can speak to you truths that I cannot because he knows everything about you and I cannot. Your spouse cannot. The people that you think can, cannot. They are going to let you down because only God knows what you need and when to say it. The reality of it is, especially in husbands and wives, I've just been reminded of a course we ran a few years ago, which we should do again, is laugh yourself, laugh your way to a better marriage and how, you know, the fix it and the, I just want to rent. And then the I just want to vent gets crossed because the guys want to fix it because they can see the problem. And the girls are going, I just, I just want to tell you. I don't need an answer. I just need to tell you. Do you know those things? That barrier is removed when you say, God, you speak to me. Because it's not like, well, maybe you should try this. I don't want to try this. God says he will overcome that. And maybe you're reading the Bible and you're sort of going, it's actually just a bit dry for me. It's actually just words, words on pages. I've been there before, especially in some scriptures where you don't want to read it. You want to read the good stuff, you know, like the Psalms and it's poetry to your ears. You don't want to understand why God took people through processes in the desert and how many children they had and why they had to divide things and why there was a wheel within a wheel. And and you're sort of thinking, those things are in the Bible, I promise you. I can't teach them right now because I still have to figure them out for myself. But the reality of it is you can read those things and you're going, what is this all about? I'll say it later. What is this all about? And you sort of think, God, I don't understand this. 
He's given us this book, not so that we can go, I don't understand it, let's close the book. He's given us this book so we can say, God, what is it that you actually want to teach me? And it is so God to time everything so right because when you read this book, it's not like God show me because I'm so clever. We need the Holy Spirit because it says the Holy Spirit reveals, teaches, and instructs. So when you sit down to read this this week, today, tomorrow, whenever you make your time, number one, make time for it. Because if you don't make time for it, you won't have time for it. Facebook will shout louder. Instagram will ring in your ears and all the notifications will come up when you pick up your phone because that's where we read our Bibles right now, hey? And so it's even a bigger distraction that the enemy would want to throw at you. So maybe turn your phone off and pick up a book that doesn't have notifications if that's your distraction. Whatever it takes, make the time and say, God, I need you. I need you to show me a truth that I've never seen in this before. Because the word says in 2 Corinthians the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. So if all you're doing is just reading this, like words on a paper, you need the Spirit to say, God, show me. Show me truths, because when you show me these truths, they'll come alive to me. My heart will respond to it. Then the why it is so important will start becoming big and strong, and you would start understanding it. And then you will see a change in your life. There's a book called The Power of Speaking God's Word. Joyce Meyer wrote it. And for those of you who don't have it, I strongly suggest you get one. And for those of you who have one and you know of somebody who needs one, trust God that you can be a blessing and get them one. And what, what this book is, is, is actually just God's gift, how he uses people. It's, it's everything you need for life and godliness is in the Bible. And Joyce Meyer, who is a teacher of the Word, she went and she, she broke things down into different, into different topics like confidence. When you're battling with confidence, God, what does your word say about my confidence? What does it say about encouragement or faith or peace or power or rejection or submission to authority, husbands for wives, wives for husbands, children, all these sort of things, victory, worship, wisdom. She's broken it down into different topics that we all experience. That when you sit down and go, God, I don't actually even know what your word says. I don't even know where to start, but I'm feeling this way. Let me read that. And it is all God's scriptures. Like I've just done about the Word of God, she has done for topics that, that you might never have experienced before, but you know if somebody might. And she's written it down. And you pray those things over you, saying, God, your Word says, I hear my Father's voice and the voice of the stranger I will not know. Your Word says that I'm your sheep, God, and I know how to hear your voice. I just opened that. We all need to know that. God, I know that when I read your Bible, you will speak to me. This is, is something that you can sit down with your Bible and then, you know, from there, go on to other things. But make it a priority to read your Bible. The reality of it is, like we said in the beginning, is our main goal of reading Bible is not just to fill half an hour or 10 minutes or however much time you want to dictate to it or, or put aside for it. And it shouldn't be just a religious duty. We had a course, Knowing God, Fiona Desmontan, you guys have heard this before, and the only homework you had to pass an entire term of a course was not an exam, and it wasn't even to memorize a scripture. It was just to read your Bible. Do you know how many people failed that course? In Bible college. You guys can judge them. It's bad. I'm joking. Don't judge anyone because we're all on a journey. But the reality of it is, it is the first thing to get attacked. First thing. Don't spend as much time can't pray as much, don't know what to pray, don't know where you are, God, I don't even know how to feel you. And, it's a, and what I want to say is the main goal is not to do that. The main goal to come to church is not to go, oh, I'm having a coffee, oh, I'm putting up a banner. The main goal is to know him. The main goal in reading this Bible is not just to fill your time and get information because it's nothing. The main goal is to go, God, I need to know you through this scripture. I need to understand the qualities you're trying to teach me, my behavior that needs to line up with this. God, what is it that I need to know? That should be our main goal. Not a intelligence, tick the box, religious duty. It's empty. It's empty and you'll be disappointed. And all these things are great because, you know, we've got the what, which is the word. Now you know the why because it's so powerful and it can change your life completely. 
but nothing will make sense unless you know the who. And so today, maybe, you know, you're sitting here and you're going, I, I, don't really, I don't really get all of this, Charlene. I don't really even want it. I'm telling you, you want it. Believe me, you want it. Because if you haven't experienced it, you don't know what you're missing out on. And the who in all of this is Jesus. Jesus wants us to live a life that we are equipped and we are powerful and we have been snatched out of darkness and put into light, that we have been taken from failure and, and misfortune and just put in next to him in heaven. He says he, we get a seat right with him, the son of God who's paved the, paved the way. That's what he does from nothing, darkness, death to life, eternity with him in heaven. And so today I want to I wanna ask that if there's someone here who your mind is so busy chasing all the what's and you don't even know why. I'm doing this and I'm checking in and I'm doing all these things and you know, and you're going, at the end of the day, I don't even know what, what's this, what, why is this, what am I, why? Why am I doing all of this? And you're just chasing a, a, a deadline and you're chasing a, a paycheck and you're chasing a, a result, but the result's not ever coming. What is your why today? Why are you doing those things? And it's so easy to go, I'll get your why. When you start up a new business, when you start making a massive decision to, to, to do something with your kids, homeschooling, you know, your why is going to carry you through. It's one, good, one thing to decide I'm going to homeschool or it's one thing to say, I'm going to start my business, I can wake up when I want I can, uh, and I can see the end product, but if the why is not strong, you're going to get your first no and then you're going to go, oh, I'll sit this one out. Oh, it's too hard for me to do this. So your whys have to be quite strong. But if you don't know the who, your whys won't matter either because he will give you the why. Jesus will make sense of everything you are doing. And today you might be sitting here thinking, I, I, don't, I don't have a who. I'm my who. My boss is my who. My family is my who. But today I want to say to you, you need to find the real who, who has the perfect, perfect will prepared for you, perfect purpose prepared for you. And I'd like to pray with you today. I'd like to pray with you today because you, you're going, I've got all these what's and I actually don't have time to even figure out what my why is. But you're doing it the wrong way around. You have to start with the who. Because the who, Jesus gives you purpose, gives you a hope, gives you a future, fills all things, makes sense of all things. And so today, if you're here today, let's stand together. I'd like to pray with you. I'd like to pray, first of all, for those of you who don't know Jesus. For those of you who go, I've never actually seen it that way and I don't actually know how to respond to somebody to go, who's going to give me all the answers. If that's you today, just raise your hand and I'd like to pray with you. It's something that is actually vital for us to say, God, I, I need to take your hand so that you can lead me out of a place that is separate from you and lead me into the place that is alongside you and in you and surrounded by you. If that's you today, just raise your hand and I'd love to pray with you. This is an important part of our, of our service. We will always give an opportunity for somebody to say, God, I, ne I need you. I need you to show me why I'm doing what I'm doing. I need you to show me why so that the what's can start making sense, so that I can stop chasing and stop having to live up to people's expectations without even knowing why. And if that's you right now, just take a moment. This is a big decision and I'd like you to raise your hand and I'd love to pray with you today. If there's some people in here where you're going, look, I, I know the who, I've, I've made a decision and I know Jesus, but my why, my why is not strong. My why is because I think people expect this of me. My why is, is, is even, I don't even have a why or, or there's no room for a why in my house and I'm just trying to do all the what's to please everybody around me. I'd like to pray for you today because God says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Your what's should not be driving you. Your watch should not be overpowering you. Your watch should not be consuming you. And so today I would like to pray with you today. If you feel tired, frustrated, in a dead hand, and you think, I don't even know what else to do, I just want to stop, I would love to pray with you today. Please raise your hand so we can pray. Awesome. Father, I thank you. I thank you, Jesus, that today, as we determine from this moment forward, God, to understand that your word 
is the beginning and the end for our lives, God. Not just good ideas or information on a page, but Father, full of life, full of seed, full of just potential, God, to empower us, to equip us, to make us powerful in you, Lord God, for us to understand all those things. God, I thank you that the why of your word being so vital to our lives, God, would penetrate our hearts today, Lord God, that, that we, would, we would determine and make a decision that that would be what we build our lives on today. God, that anything that does not line up with the word of God, we will not pay attention to. But Father, we will pay attention to things that you have spoken. God, and we do not use it as an excuse to call up random things. But Father, we would pray what your word says in line with what your word says. And so, Father God, we thank you that you've already gone before us and given us everything we need. When we do not know what to pray, God, it is there. God, and I pray that as we, as we set our hearts and our eyes on this journey, Lord God, as, we, as we're moving into a new season, Father, that those truths would once again gird us up, strengthen us, straighten up our shoulders and give us, lift up our heads, Lord God, and give us light that shines in our hearts and, and in our eyes, God, that you would lead us, you would direct us, you would make our paths straight. And so, Father God, I pray, Lord, where people's wise have, have just, has just blurred, why are they even doing this life? Why have they even tried, God, that you would remind them that first and foremost, God, you have reconciled them with the maker, with their creator, the one who holds the plan, the one who holds their heart and their lives. That you have saved them and rescued them from an eternity away from you, God, and you have got plans that far exceed anything they can dream, hope, or imagine. And so, God, that's where it starts. And so, God, I thank you that our why we do everything would be because we want to know you, God. We want everything of you to, to take over everything of us. And so, Father, I just commit this week to you, and I thank you that you would, you would start speaking truth into those areas, God. That our, your word, we would be hungry for your word, Father. That we would, we would want more of your word. That you would start creating an appetite for your word. And I thank you, God, that, that as we wait on your spirit, Father, we would see things that we would burst, Lord God, because of the truth that's transforming us. And we thank you, God, you would change us from the inside out. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said... Amen.